Guys, we have a serious problem. And it's one so big that it may destroy the reality of Star Trek. The problem I'm referring to is warp speed, specifically how fast warp speed actually is supposed to be. And it came up in the comments in my last video, which was an alternative battle scenario in Star Trek VI where Chancellor Gorkin's Katinga cruiser ends up actually fighting the Enterprise. I had written in one of the stats a warp speed about the Enterprise A being able to make emergency speed of warp 14. And I did indeed put in brackets DOS scale, but it seems I might just be getting really old school as far as being a Trekkie because so many comments that called me out according to the information they had of course. And that is as of TNG or the next generation, no one can make past warp 10 as warp 10 is infinite. Well, yes, this is true, but that is the TNG warp speed scale. So let's dive into this. Let's unpack how fast warp speed actually is, how long it takes to get from one place to another, and is warp 14 the same as warp 10 in the next generation, etc. But before we get into all that, let me take about 30 seconds to pretty much promote myself. I typically don't like to take on sponsors, and I'm pretty much a one-man show here, and YouTube ad revenue has its ups and downs, which is why I have a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash resurrected. Here my patrons can get access to works in progress, 3D model assets, and at $8 tiers and higher they can get a customized Starship render using any available assets that I have. From still shots to Starship battle clips. Alright, let's get back into explaining actual warp speeds. So let's backtrack to the original days of Star Trek. Speeds of warp 10 or more, while considered very fast, were not unheard of at all. In fact, in the early days of TNG, even Warp 14 and higher was a thing in the episode where no man has gone before. Let me explain a little bit. There was a time when the actual speed of warp travel followed a simple and straightforward formula, and that was simply that a warp factor is the speed of light cubed. This came from something amazing they did in the original series that modern Star Trek has failed to do. They had an actual Star Trek Bible for the writers and directors of the time. And that is where the light speed cube formula comes from for warp factors. So for example, if the Enterprise travels at warp 7, which is pretty high for that ship at the time, they're traveling at 343 times the speed of light, which means they could reach our nearest star, Proxima Centauri, at four light years away in four days and some change. Or they could make the planet Vulcan in the 40 Iridani system in about 17 days. The Enterprise A is a much newer ship based on the original Enterprise refit of the Constitution class and is capable of far greater speeds, whereas the original Enterprise makes about warp 8 as the maximum safe cruising speed. The Enterprise A can make warp 14 in an emergency according to most tech manuals and lore, so that is 2,744 times the speed of light, meaning the Enterprise could reach Proxima Centauri in a few hours at that speed. Now the TNG formula is not so straightforward, but it is to a degree up to warp 9. The formula is the warp factor to the power of 10 over 3, or the power of 3.33, rather than simply cubed. So warp 7 in the TNG scale, rather than 343 times the speed of light, would be 651 times the speed of light, and warp 9 would be 1505 times the speed of light. So it would seem that the Enterprise A at the maximum warp of warp 14 in the TNG scale is still somewhere above warp 9. Above warp 9 we have to use a different formula because at warp 9.6, which is the maximum speed of the Enterprise D, the TNG formula puts this at 1743 times the speed of light, which is still much slower than warp 14 in the original scale of 2744 times the speed of light. But there's more to this formula. So I went to this website, which has got some interesting information at uh, ditl.org. And it's kind of interesting, so check it out. Uh, velocity is warp factor times uh, 10 to the third plus A plus LN, whereas the subspace field density is electromagnetic flux and 11 or 12. Cochrane refraction F1 and F2 are the Cochrane refraction index respectively under a size like if you do warp 7 you go into the thing and you do that carry the 3 6 times 5 to the 3rd to the 
the nitum and nauseum to the other and then move that over times 20 you do like a formula there and then it comes around to the thing and then oh god no i'm not great at algebra maybe if my teachers had given me equations like how to calculate warp speeds i would be amazing at it by now but there are a few things about this equation I find very intriguing. There's the subspace field density is one of them. You see, in Star Trek, warp speeds manipulate space in a way to utilize subspace, but this may also refer to the time-space constant. And this constant is not constant. In other words, time in space near something like a black hole is much slower due to the presence of a massive gravity well. And time in space is faster or more constant at least the further away you get from these gravitational forces. So this has a bearing on the overall warp speed relative to everything else in the universe. Also in this formula he puts in something called the Cochrane Refraction and Reflection Indexes which I believe has to do with the degree of which space is distorted by your warp drive. And finally there is Electromagnetic Flux which refers to the amount of magnetic field lines that are in that area of space, which can come from any number of celestial bodies or electromagnetic storms, etc. This means that the velocity of warp speed is, well, it depends, and it's not constant. I honestly kind of like this idea a lot. It is not unlike the sea state. In calm seas, you can make much better time than you would in rough or stormy seas. Warp 9 in deep interstellar space will actually be quite a bit faster than warp 9 in some place like a vast nebula due to electromagnetic forces, gravitational influences, etc. In this way warp speeds become a little bit more like hyperdrive in Star Wars universe honestly. Because the speed of hyperdrive depends on what hyperdrive route you are on. The main hyperdrive highways can get you across the galaxy in weeks, whereas less charted minor routes can take far longer. Of course, hyperdrive is mostly different in science than warp drive, as far as we know. And finally, I just want to point out that often the writers and world builders of sci-fi universes such as Star Trek especially, are often totally oblivious of distance and time traveled in space. There's a reason a cruiser like the Enterprise needs to be the size it is. It shouldn't take seconds to travel from one star to another, but more like days, weeks, months, and for deep space travel years, unless these ships travel above warp 9 on the TNG scale all the time, but we know that they do not. The verisimilitude or consistent believability of Star Trek is often flawed and made worse by the nature of modern Star Trek, but it is my hope that future writers will take things like travel distance and other technicalities into account. But the verisimilitude of warp travel and warp factors is something that is consistently broken throughout Star Trek. It's a tough one, after all, as writers do not have warp equations and 3D maps of the Star Trek universe in front of them. Thank you for watching, Space Friends. Remember, there's a lot of stuff at patreon.com forward slash resurrected if you'd like to become a member. If you don't care for Patreon, that's fine. Just be sure to comment. I like reading them. And subscribing and liking will also help. And here are the credits from my current Patreon supporters at the end of this video. Until next time, space friends.